all of a sudden he just wee wee all over my face. <laughs> I learned not to be so inquisitive anymore. Vince was very photogenic. One day they had this milk truck come around and they saw him, they wanted to take his picture. I put little Buster Brown short pants on him and high top shoes and they took his picture and he made the calendar. He would be kind of shy in front of the immediate family. But when you put him by himself in front of more people, then he was another person. Vince and his sister both took dancing lessons. They took tap, they took ballet, and he loved to dress up. He wore the little tights. Then as he got a little older, they wanted to take ice skating lessons. We entered this competition. I was amazed of the jumps and twirls and stuff that he was doing. He was the best figure skater. He was number one. Vince must have been probably 12 or 13 when we moved to Glendora. When I first worked with Vince in eighth grade, he was very raw talent. Vince wanted to be part of the popular group of kids that played the instruments with the choir. He loved music. He wanted to be a guitar player, but we already had some guitar players. Vince was doing the singing, primarily. We did some stuff from the rock opera Tommy. He's a big ball it was really a great way to get attention and a great way to be liked. Vince loved the attention the girls gave him. Girls made him feel good, so Vince's direction was, gee, I need more of this. I met Vince at Charter Oak High School. I was a big Van Halen fan at the time. I was looking to put something like that together. Vince had the longest hair in the school. He kind of looked like a rock star already. I thought he looked a little like Dave Roth. I asked Vince uh, if he'd sang, and he said he had sang in a band. He got into this band called Rock Candy. We got together at a friend's house to play together. Vince was real timid, and the voice was weak. We sang Hot Legs by Rod Stewart. Hot legs. I remember trying to coach him into putting a little more oomph behind it, and that's when I was pretty sure he hadn't sang in a band before. <laughs> Rock Candy was doing a lot of covers. Cheap Trick, some Eddie Money, Led Zeppelin. As we played more and more things, Vince seemed to become more confident. His voice became stronger and bigger. When Vince was on stage, he was a very different person. He would just lose himself. He had so much charisma that he could really get an audience going. The girls loved him. I couldn't believe this was my boy. Vince switched from Charter Oak High School over to Royal Oak High School. Vince and Tommy met through school. Tommy played in the US 101 band and he played like Beach Boy stuff. They were like goody two shoes band. We were like a rock band. Tommy looked up to Vince a lot. He introduced the bad girls to Tommy and Tommy loved it. Everybody thought Vince was just like the hottie. Vince was respected because he was the ladies man. Vince's girlfriend was Tammy Jones. They fell in love. Eventually, they had a baby together. Vince was 16 years old. Having a baby at that young age, I think, added a lot of stress to Vince's life. Vince started losing interest in school then. His grades started sliding. It got to the point where he just didn't want to go to school anymore. When Vince dropped out of school, we were very upset because he had so much potential. He was spending more and more time just in his music. Vince's mom and dad wanted him to have something to fall back on. We were very disappointed. We wanted him to be a lawyer or a doctor. I wanted him at least to you know, get a high school diploma. I didn't want him to just be bouncing from one job to another. Vince had a little temper. He wanted things done his way, not our way. Vince moved out of the house when he was 17. I was devastated. I wanted him to come home. How could he make it in the music field? He was just a boy from Glendora. The more Rock Candy played, the bigger the crowds were getting. We played a lot of small clubs, and then we worked our way into Hollywood. We played the Starwood. It's a whole different trip. It's definitely a next step up. To us, that was, you know, as big as it can ever get. Rock Candy's playing, and Nicky shows up. I knew of Nicky from the band that he played in called London. Tommy told Nicky about Vince being the singer of Rock Candy. Nicky came and said, I found this new lead singer. It's this guy with this unusual voice. He's fronting a band called Rock Candy. Vince said, there's this band that wants to pay me 150 bucks a week to play with them. 
Vince was pretty dedicated to our band at that time. I go, 150 bucks? Buddy, anytime you can make money doing this thing, go do it. He had the look, but his voice was a little suspect, so we decided we'd go with the look and we'll have to work with the voice as we go. Mickey had the final cog in his vision in getting Vince Neil. Once Vince joined, something really clicked. Vince was on his way to be a rock star, and that's what he wanted to be, and that was all there was to it. When Tommy and Nikki and Vince and Mick finally hooked up, it just came together. They seemed to have a good camaraderie and uh, seemed to click pretty good. My brother, John, was a roadie for Mick Mars. And John gave us a call saying that uh, Mick had just gotten together with a new group and we should come down and see them. My husband wanted to get involved in the music business. Alan Kaufman had already made money doing real estate. He came down and took a look at him. He met with the group and said, OK, I like what I see. Let's go ahead and cut a deal. Alan had a lot of money and started pumping the money into the band. The idea was he needed to spend money to make the group look important, to make them look like they had already hit number one. They had better clothes and better equipment. Tommy told me that we're going to call the band Motley Crew, you know, with the umlauts. Well, I knew he didn't even know what umlauts were. It was all coming from Nikki. You'd see Nikki and the other band members going around Hollywood plastering their posters on all the lamp posts. Motley started playing clubs right away. The first show was at the Starwood. There were a lot of people there that were probably already fans of London, and this was Nikki's new band. It was like, what's this going to be about? When Motley Crue hit the stage, it was chaos. It was big and it was loud and it was aggressive. I just flipped out. That was their first show and just people went nuts. I was all proud, you know, I was all, yeah, that's, that's my brother. Things were a little rusty, but you could tell the sound was there, the look was there, the energy was there. It wasn't like, oh my God, this is going to go straight to the moon. They really were jolly. They were determined. There was something so outstandingly different with Motley Crue. You just couldn't help but say to yourself that these guys are either going to fall flat on their face or they're going to go right to the top. In early 1981 in L.A., the New Wave was probably the biggest scene going on. It was mostly either dance music or punk rock music. Bands like X and Motels. There was a lot of the knack in the car. I guess you're just what I needed. Just what I needed. There was like a punk, skinny tied, short haired reality. Motley's music was different. Motley Crue just represented kind of the underdog because there wasn't a lot of metal. They started playing around, and at first people were like, Motley, what? What? What is it? The crew's whole look was something that nobody in L.A. was doing. It was kind of girly, kind of freaky. When I saw the way they dressed, you know, I was startled. Vince had makeup on better than I could ever put it on. People were saying that he looked like a transvestite. A lot of guys might have felt threatened by that. Nikki didn't want to take no from nobody. If anybody gave any boy, he'd retaliate right back. Nikki was fighting with some punk rockers out in front of the whiskey and got beat up kind of badly. Had a really gnarly black eye. <laughs> but he thought that was cool. Motley Crue were definitely the street tough kids. We arranged for an apartment for them. Mr. Kaufman put him up in a sleazy apartment and it was awful. Motley Crue lived on Clark Street, just a half a block above the whiskey. Tommy called me up, oh, you got to see, you got to see, we got our first apartment, you know. So I said, well, all right, what number is it? He goes, don't worry, you'll find it. The door was like coming off the hinges. Well, there was a mountain of beer cans outside. There was one plant in the corner, it was dead. It was pretty destroyed. The apartment was done. Every time they did a show, there was an after party. They'd announce on stage, hey, everybody, there's a party at the house tonight. Come on up the street. Next thing you know, half of L.A. is showing up. People just drinking. There was girls everywhere, wall-to-wall -wall girls. Blonde, big tits, little clothing. They all want Nikki Six. They weren't wearing their own half naked in there. I hated it. 
It was better than the Miss America beauty pageant or Hugh Hefner's swimming pool. I'd walk into rooms and just be astonished. I hadn't seen that kind of stuff in my life before. I would hear all the reports about them getting wilder and crazier. And then the cops had kicked down the door so many times that there was no more lock on the door. The only way that Alan and I had to control what the guys did at all was through money. Basically, the group was put on an allowance. If you want money, you have to conduct yourself in a certain way. We gave them $20 each a week to live on. They already needed $2 a week for hairspray. They had no food. They were eating junk. They were basically just living off of whoever will help them out at the time. The money they did have, they would drink it, you know. They would party with it. I brought a McDonald's. When I walked in, I had French fries, and they would split them up. They would count them. One for you, one for you, one for you. And I'm going, this is really 